Hello, one day is Thursday, August 11, 2022, and this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for attending tonight. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. So, we talk about well, obviously, current market conditions. I'll have a tremendous amount to say about that when we get to the live charts. Your questions on trading, your favorite stock and crypto picks. Crypto's heating up again. So, last uh, for a while, I've been talking to these shows about how, well, let's not even bother with crypto, but I think it's beginning to, to, to bottom out and rally. And we'll take a look at that in just one second. So we're gonna focus on these are the ones we have been waiting for or live for, and that'll make sense in a few minutes. I wanna talk about a missed million dollar trade, and I think you guys know what that is. Again, crypto trying to wake up. So we'll talk about that. Also have an opening gap reversal day trade I wanna show. And the way it worked out, I didn't get around to post it in the group, and my apologies for that. That was a disclaimer screen, as you know, you can lose money trading, or as often summing up, all pictures about the future and a lot of stuff in between now and then. I borrowed that from my buddy Greg Morris. These are the ones that we have been waiting for. I've done this type of webinar a couple of times, covered this topic at least over the past several years. I wish uh, I wish I did it every webinar, <laughs> to be frank, but maybe we're getting to that point again, that point of the cycle. And where I got this silly quote from is there were a group of politicians without being political, but they, I thought it was kind of a stupid thing to say. And it does, it has no, nothing to do with their affiliation. It's just with their egoness, uh, if that's a word, <laughs> with their egos. They, they got a bunch of them together from one particular party. And then they made this big announcement and they said, we are the ones that we have been waiting for. And I just thought that was kind of a, stupid thing to say but it kind of stuck with me and these are the ones that we have been waiting for so i'm going to go through these fairly quickly because i, I talked about them a lot in the stock charts show and this one might not be one we're waiting for but it came pretty dang close you can see it had a nice thrust from lows kind of a sloppy bow tie but look at okay as far as the bow tie is concerned and looking pretty good as far as a setup and i'll show you a couple things that are there that i was seeing and so there's a setup, buy at 475, stop at 375, IPT of 575. But Dave, that's like that's like 20%. Stop. It's like, yeah, but that's what it calls for, okay? Notice on that one particular day, it's got about, what, 70 cents? And just one day, that's, what, uh, 50, 20% move or, or in just one day. So if you forget about the scaling, then it's not that big of a deal, kind of like the ARLP was a 25% stop. And people often email me. In fact, I got an email recently about a couple of my recommendations that they said, well, I can't trade something with 20% stop. It's like, yes, you can adjust your share size down. So for instance, we only bought 2000 shares of AR ARLP, but now that actually is beginning to become something. And I'll talk a little bit about that one, a little bit more about that one in just one second. So this one, we had entry here, stop here, IPT of here, and it came dangerously close within like a penny or so of that IPT. Now, I don't split hairs in a situation like this. And also, I've got to be careful because I've been, I feel like I am getting a little pressure to take profits, partial profits, a little bit early. And the reason that is, is because on my Trading Simplified show, I'm showing my next 100 trades. And I really want, and I was in a bit of a hole for a while there. I'm just starting to climb out of it. And I really wanted to put some money, uh, well, I always want to put money in a cap, but I wanted to put some some winter trades and some money into the, the spreadsheet, some real money, so I could show how the methodology works. And and the real, real money is in the second loaf. And I'll explain that in just one second. So there, there were the trades. Again, I've covered these. If, if you check my website, you can see the show that I covered uh, these particular trades. But I picked up a couple thousand shares because that's what it called for based on a, my service use a hypothetical 100K account. So in this account, what I did is, or what I often do more often than not, is try to mimic the surface the best I can so I could actually show these trades when they occur. Anyway, if you do hit your initial profit target, you bring that stop up to break even. Now, I don't wanna talk out of both sides of my mouth, but in this case, since the service still has a stop at a lower level because 
mechanically it hasn't hit that level yet. And I'll show you the spreadsheet again in, in a few minutes. Uh, I'm leaving my stop a little bit looser, but ideally I don't want to lose overall on the trade. But when it gets close like this, and if you go in and watch the last week of charts was a couple of weeks ago, I talked a lot about discretion. And a few of you have emailed me since thanking me, and, and, and I, I appreciate you appreciated it, believe me, uh, because discretion could really help you out quite a bit. Because let's say this trade doesn't pan out, at least you make a little bit on it, and you're getting closer and closer and closer to the next big winner. Now, just real quick, again, the bow tie on this was a little bit on the sloppy side, meaning that it wasn't really, really tight and didn't look like an actual bow tie, but it was a bow tie nonetheless. And there were some other great things that were working for it. Bigger picture wise, you'll notice a cup and handle type of pattern. I'm a big fan of the cup and handle. I don't buy them in and of themselves, but often the bow ties and first thrust and patterns like that on things of that nature set up within these bigger picture cup and handles. I was in an interview earlier today, and they were asking me about the bigger picture. How do I look at the short term versus the long term? Well, the short term is the bow ties or the first thrust or whatever pattern I'm trading, trading just to pull back in general. And then the bigger picture, if I've got a cup and handle working for me, that tends to help. And you, you got to wrap your head, head around why these bigger picture patterns work. And if as long as you can obviously agree with with the premise so with the with the cup and handle it's like you got all these people just giving up on this thing selling 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 and then that selling begins to subside and then eventually maybe through death or taxes or whatever things that are inevitable <laughs> the a little bit more gets sold more and more and more and then at some point there's a bit of an accumulation now you don't want to try to pick that bottom for thinking that you got it like right here for instance we had a nice little rally you might have said ah it's the bottom let's just rush in and then what happens you get one more flush out now by the way i'm trying to explain to a friend of mine and he's slowly wrapping his head around and i work out with him every day and uh i think he's still looking for logic and reasoning in the markets and i'm trying to explain to him that we're trading traders and not markets and the people who bought the stock before you are a bigger concern than the company in and of itself. And that's that's some reasoning from Tom McClellan. And, and, and he went on to say, and those people will screw you. I was also asked in an interview earlier today about certainty going into an investment. How much certainty do you have? And it's like, well, you have 100% certainty looking at the setup, but the moment you buy the stock or sell short the stock you have stepped into the unknown and things can happen and and uh mark douglas once said all it takes is one a-hole screw up a perfectly good trade but anyway the one reason i like this the stock rallied 90 percent off its lows and then had a fairly deep pullback and again cup and handle and notice this move was fairly persistent meaning that it tended to go up day after day after day and that's one thing that i i think i'm going to start doing more and more of as I show you setups, as I show you my trades, I'm gonna spend a little bit more time on how I pick the, the trades. And I'm gonna talk about this in a few minutes, but if you wanna get a jump on that, go in and look at the service archives and you can go back many, many, many years. I know I have a gap in there somewhere and I'll probably never find those hard drives, but if I ever do, I'll fill in the gaps. Anyway, let's take a look at Verve. This is newer trade it was new to the stock chart show and you could see that we had an entry of 26 a stop way down at 18 that's a risk of eight points but we adjusted way down in share size only 250 shares in this case entry was here stop was down here ipt was here and you can see it triggered an entry first day it came right back in our second day of the trade it was a bit of a bummer and then as of today it has rallied to hit that initial profit target so that stop is now at break even and uh, the service said 250 shares per 100k i just rounded up to 300 in this particular account now for reporting purposes i might normalize that back down to 250 but that's the actual trade that i made and i do take these in more than one account fyi 
Now, this one was a, on the cusp of being almost a little too crazy, even for Big Dave. But it did have a 243% rally from the lows, which is pretty darn impressive, obviously. I also noticed that rally began to, the stock began to accelerate higher in that rally, almost in like a blow-off type of move. And you could, you could see that it did pull back very, very deeply from that. So when you see a move like this, 243% or even 90% like the previous one, you want to make sure that you've got a pretty serious sell-off to knock some people out of the trade, maybe even attract some eager shorts to the trade. And should it start to rally again, those shorts are going to get punished. And those people, the Johnny Come Latelys who bought late in the trend, they're the first in and first out. They're going to be forced to put up or shut up and possibly get back in. Anyway. Let's look at riots. Now, this one I sold a little early, again, using discretion and, again, trying to just squeeze out some profits. And the uh, one thing I've been thinking about lately, it's kind of, I know I'm such a nerd, but the, what's it called, the Heisenberg theory or something, uh, when, it, when it deals with quantum physics, I know you probably want to party with me, but the particles are so little, the the act of you observing them makes them act in a different way. So I think they call it the Heisenberg principle or Heisenberg theory. And I think, uh, what's it, Mr. White named himself that in, in Breaking Bad. But I, I, known, I knew of the concept long before that. But anyway, that's where that Heisenberg thing comes from. So my point is, trying to be all intellectual with you, but my point is that um, the fact that I'm trying to show trades and the fact that I'm in a little in a hole on this one particular project it's like I find myself really anxious to lock in some gains, but I still want to also play that longer term gain on the remainder of the shares so I can knock one or two out of the park and show everybody how this stuff really can work. So anyways, that was a service for that day. The IMO and YSG did not trigger, but the riot did. Now, in this case, 1,600 shares on a 100K account for a risk of a buck and a quarter and again that seems quite volatile but if you look at how far this thing moves over a short period of time that's well within reason so the stop you'll just see in just one second thrust from lows pull back entry here stop is right there stop isn't really that far away from the bottom of the trade and i've done presentations before where i talk about oh, well i can't i can't trade no 20% stop. And it's like, well, you don't get no coke, you know, like they said in, in Caddyshack. Anyway, so entry there, stop down there, IPT up here. And you see it rallies up and it gets, it hits the IPT officially. Now, in my case, I did take profits a little early and I'll show you that. Well, the trade's right here. You can see I did take profits early, but 1600 around 710 and, you know, 80 cents, that's a decent move on a seven dollar stock okay so i figured it was worth it the real money is in the second loaf on the trade it was much higher earlier in the day as you can see the real money is in this longer term trend which i hope and i know I just said hope but i hope develops so in this case we had a 97 percent rally off the lows notice that the trend was beginning to accelerate in that rally I'm having some issues with my foot, so you might see me dancing around a little bit tonight. I'm a hope I'm hoping I can make it through the webinar. <laughs> anyway, 97% rally from the lows, a little pullback in there. Nice, 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 bigger picture cup and handle type of pattern. Again, I'm not trading directly off that, but I've got my bow tie set up in here. I've got a pullback set up, so I think it's worth a shot. Plus, crypto's waking up. Not in this case, it's not confusing issue with facts because this stock will likely trade very close to crypto in fact i was talking with one of you guys last week and you know how if you buy like a gold miner especially like a junior gold miner their their leverage so if the price of gold jumps 100 or 200 300 bucks their stock is not going to jump in proportion it's going to jump maybe twice in proportion because of their leverage and i'm thinking like something like Riot, let's say Riot's got a bunch of computers mining Bitcoin, and you've got 10% of the computers are on the cusp of losing money. They're just breaking even maybe because of electricity and everything with a, um, I forget where Bitcoin is now, with uh, 
a thirty thousand dollar Bitcoin or whatever. We'll take a look at it in one second. But then all of a sudden, Bitcoin jumps to forty thousand. Then those computers are actually making money. So they have a bit of a leverage, and it's kind of hard to wrap your head around mining. And I know it took me a while to to understand it. But so maybe those miners begin to pay off again. There are miners now. A computer, you can take them home, plug them in, and depending on your your AC uh, costs, your electricity costs, I should say, it it would maybe lose ten bucks a day. <laughs> you know, if you buy one of these cheaper ones, so you really need to spend about ten thousand dollars on a on a crypto miner. And and I looked into it because I'm a nerd, and I figured, you know, well, well, let, well, Dave, let's have a hobby that could actually pay for itself and more. And then I realized, you know, stick in your wheelhouse, do something more fun. Instead of uh, maintaining a computer that makes a lot of noise, makes a lot of heaps, and uh, probably doesn't make a lot of money, especially if your ten thousand dollar machine uh, goes out. And good luck getting a warranty on on those things. Anyway, so if we take a look at the spreadsheet, so these are hopefully, and I just said hope, I know that, but hopefully the next ARLP. Now ARLP was pretty amazing. It was a $5 energy company. I didn't realize it was a it was a, a coal company of all things, you know. In this day and age, a coal company, well, if you need to charge your electric car, you got to burn some coal, right, to create the electricity to charge the car. I know, it makes no sense, but my feeling there is not anti-electric car because I'm glad they're building electric cars. You got to start somewhere if you're going to find clean energy and clean things for the future. But right now, there's a lot of coal being burned to power electric cars. And that's just a fact of life. But yeah, it'd be great if we all could run our cars, electric cars on renewables. All right, let's get back to the to the, to the the winners. Now, I could tell that I was getting close to some winners. And it kind of reminds me of, of um, a speech that uh, had a cassette tape of it that Mark Douglas gave at probably in 1995 at the Technical Analysis Group Conference, which TAG no longer exists. I think Money Show ended up buying them out, but they, they got bought out three or four times before Money Show ended up, in, ended up with them in Traders Expo too. But anyway, at that conference, I bought his tape because I was more interested in being a setup junkie and, as opposed to listening to psychology. And you know what, all those setups or whatever, I don't think I learned a damn thing, but I did learn a lot from listening to Douglas's cassette. And anyway, he talks about a good salesman versus a bad salesman. And, and you guys that know me here, bear with me. I know I tell the story every webinar, but he said a, a bad salesman makes three or four sales calls, gets rejected three or four times in a row, and then he goes out and drinks his lunch. A, a good salesman, gets rejected three or four times in a row and he starts to think, okay, let me go get a cup of coffee. Let me get geared up here. Let me get jazzed up again. I've got these bad calls out of the way. And the more the more bad calls that are out of the way, the closer I am to making a sale. Whereas the bad salesman gets bummed out and then he decides to go drink his lunch. I'm a little off focus here. I don't know if you want me in focus. <laughs> Good Lord, Dave. <laughs> I had a better day than I look, I swear. <laughs> anyway, so the the thing, of, the point I'm making here, and I could tell we we're getting close to these, but I didn't know when. And as I've said a thousand times, I wear my feelings on my sleeve. I go home. My wife Marcy's like, "What's wrong?" You know, she she knows what's wrong. She can look at look at me and tell. And I uh, said, well, babe, I'm in a drawdown. It's not looking too good. And I'm having trouble finding new setups because the conditions aren't cooperating. So I have to be patient. And she's like, well, when you come out of the drawdown? I'm like, I don't know. You know, it's like you never know. But you just seem to come out of it just at the right time. You know, and no sooner, believe me. And I've seen quite a few people come into service. And I hate to see this. It really pains me. I'm getting tougher and tougher and tougher and tougher about it. And I just, it doesn't bother me as much as it used to, but it still bothers me to watch somebody come in new to my trading service and either 
I do nothing, I do nothing, I do nothing, and then they quit, and then I recommend the next three or four big huge winners, or at least one huge winner, or they come in and they lose money, lose money, lose money on two or three trades, and they start thinking about, oh, well, wait a minute, you know, what's the old saying? Screw me once, shame on you, screw me twice, shame on me. They start having those feelings, and they just don't fully grasp what trend trading is all about and how trend trading can be streaky at times, a term I was told not to use, but it's true. You you wait, you wait, you wait, you wait, you wait, and then you bam, you hit it out of the park, you know, make a little, lose a little, make a little, lose a little, lose a little, lose a little, lose a little, bam. But most people give up and go off to chase rainbows and and try to find somebody else. And every now and then they hit it right. And as I'll say in a minute, that could be actually more dangerous than losing, 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 and then finally start making money. Because those who knock it out of the park, like I do have one gentleman recently came in and um, he, I think he said, I'll have to find an email, but it's like it's, it was his first three profitable trades in a row. And then all three of them came from me. And he was so excited. And I had to really temper his expectations. And I've seen it like in 99 and times like that when we're absolutely printing money because the market's going straight up, right? People will do stupid things like quit their jobs or tell a boss to F off or whatever. And that's the worst thing is it goes to their head and they think that they have this permanent income hypothesis like it's always going to be that way. But anyway, it's tough. You know, you lose, you lose, you lose, or you board, 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 board. Sometimes I'll go a month or longer, I think uh, six weeks, but maybe a little longer is my record. And it's like, why am I paying this guy to tell me to not do anything? It's like, well, as I preach, if I'd have had that guy 20 something years ago, I would have saved myself a lot of money instead of trying to come in and make money every day. But yeah, again, it's lose, 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 or you're bored, you're bored, you're bored, you quit, and then bam, the next several trades or the big ones. Now, trend trading is not easy, but it's the best way to trade if you want to generate longer term wealth. If you think about it, in order to make money on a trade, what do you have to do? Well, you got to buy at this level and you have to sell at a level that's higher than this level. I'm not saying buy low, sell high. I'm saying you have to, because as a trend trader, you're gonna, the market's going to be higher when you buy it, right? but you will have to sell higher than you buy. So where you buy to where you sell, if it's a profitable trade, that is a trend. And as you know, we're trying to get in for that swing trade, take a partial profit off half, and then free roll on the remainder of the position to hopefully, I know I just said hope, but hopefully stay in the position for a long, long time. The ARLP was put on in 2020, or maybe one day into 2021, but it's right around the end of 2020, is when the setup was first recommended. Now, trend trading really requires the fine art of doing nothing. And the more successful you are, the harder that is going to be. And I'm not going to go into the long psychological diatribe about it, but the bottom line is, because I've done that so many times, the bottom line is the more successful you are in a lot of cases in life, the harder trade is going to be because, you know, unless you just stepped in it and got lucky or it was handed to you, you probably worked really hard and for a long time for the money you earned to trade. And you feel like you have to take that action all the time in the markets. So it really does require the fine art of doing nothing while waiting for trades to come along and waiting once you're in trades. As I often say, we're more weight-ers than we are trade-ers, especially if you're following a swing to intermediate term trend trading methodology. Now, most can't handle, again, the nuances, and, and that's the secret of trading is find a system, simple system, look at it, test it, study it, feel comfortable with it, feel confident in it, know the nuances, know that you're gonna get whacked, know that you're gonna, gonna be bored to death at times, waiting, 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 waiting. It's like, uh, you know, waiting for the fish, fish to bite, waiting for the wind to fly a kite. Read Dr. Seuss's, oh, the places you will go. The waiting place is, the, that could be the trading place, that, that one little, those two pages in there or whatever, the most useless place is what they call it. 
But it's not useless in trading. That's the secret of trading, believe me. But again, most can't handle these nuances and they go off to chase rainbows. But you know, here's a secret, secret to trading. One of those little secrets is not a secret. If you could handle those nuances, then you have what it takes to become successful. But first you have to learn what those nuances are. And believe me, there's plenty of times where I couldn't hit the side of the barn if I was standing inside the barn. But you know what? During those times, I keep backing off, backing off, backing off until I reach a point where it just I just can't stand it. I come across that must-take trade and not some sort of mistake trade for action, for recreation, revenge, or whatever. It's I, I wait, wait for that so-called fat pitch for that must-take trade. So the few that do become successful are those who stick it out. There's two people that become successful. Those who just stick it out and hang with me. And there's one person, I don't know if he's here tonight, but there's one person I recently talked to. He told me his portfolio is currently up 70% and he's following my stuff. Most of them, some of the some direct recommendations. I noticed one or two stocks he found on his own. Kudos to him for doing that. And he's managing them. He every now and then he he does ask me for a little guidance on stops and such. And I'm and I'm working with him to, to keep him in the positions. But all the heavy lifting is done by him. And he is taking some of the stocks again straight from my service and from the Landry list. And he just emailed me. He said he's never been up this much in his entire life. And so he's beginning to wrap his head around this methodology, the nuances of trend trading. And believe me, the nuances of trend trading are the same for everyone. The only thing that I think I, I've done that gives it a little bit added value, other than my superior stock picking, <laughs> is that the money management is such where we're just going in for a swing trade, which is a little bit more likely than the longer term trade, but through the money management and taking the partial profits and trailing the stops and letting them widen out, we're able to stick with them when they do trend longer term without too big of a corrections for a long, long time. Now, the other people that become successful too are those who try my stuff, get bored with it, or go off to chase rainbows or shiny objects or whatever, and then 10 years they come back. And those those are some of the, the best longer term clients ever. Somebody once was talking to me about wanting to market and stuff, and they said, what's your ideal client? And I said, oh, I got this doctor guy. He's just very passionate about trading and blah, blah, blah. He's been with me for 10 years, and we talk every now and then. And he goes, uh, he goes, that's a fantasy. And he basically was telling me that with his marketing help, he would bring people in because it's like a revolving door. And, and he'd just bring more and more people in because the attrition rate and all this other stuff. And I'm like, you know what? I don't care about all that. I would rather, I would rather, he was telling me it's a pipe dream going after that, that client. And that's what I want. You know what? I would rather have that longer term than have this revolving door come through. And I've, I've seen five or 10 people revolving door over the last month or two because why? Well, because I haven't knocked it out of the park. And most of that time I said, hey, let's not do anything while this market was fine and it's low. And then all of a sudden, bam, it begins to work again. Now, as I said earlier, alluded to the flip side, instant success can be worse than losing or waiting to win. And that's what I told this aforementioned gentleman as he was kind of grinding it out and losing money and getting kind of depressed about it. I said, you know what? You're going to become successful if you can continue to grind it out. Now, drop your share size down so you're not so bummed out and, and worn down. And that's from a neurological standpoint and from a psychological standpoint. And now he's becoming successful. He's beginning to finally see the light. But the fact that he lost initially and made a lot of mistakes initially, and now he's finally making it, he's beginning to realize like, okay, it's not always gonna be this great. I remember these bad times, there'll be bad times again. And by the way, um, can't think of the guy's name off the top of my head, but I've done presentations on this based on emails from clients or one client in particular. But I would say 99% of the, 95% of the time, you're probably in a drawdown. You're either losing open profits or you have outright losses. And as Greg Morris pointed out one time, markets only make new highs 4% of the time. If you're a trend trader, you need that market to make new highs in order for, be, for you to be profitable. So that's kind of a, an interesting thing. And the more you learn about this and the more you the more you're able to wrap your head around the nuances. And that's key. 
Now, one thing I was thinking about is the trading service archives, www.davelander.com slash archives. I think that's a, a treasure trove of valuable education. It might bore you to death, but if you went in and looked at those trades and go back and say, look at them over the last month or so and said, do nothing, do nothing, do nothing, and why I'm saying do nothing, and then look at the Landry list when when a lot of those just absolutely took off. And then we fortunately, we were fortunate enough, we we're fortunate enough, he tried to say, to get in a couple of those that did take off, as you just saw, as official, so to speak, recommendations. And I know some of you guys took some of those Landry list ones, as I said earlier, which is great. But that's a great education because you could see me with with, with zero hindsight looking at that, that chart shortly after the close saying, I like this stock and this is why, or I don't like these stocks, this is the best of what I could find. I don't think any of them are worth trading. And if you go in and do that, I think it's a very valuable education, especially when it comes to the why I picked the stock, the discretion involved, and so on and so forth. So I was just thinking today, and I know it's kind of cocky of me to say this, but God, that's a tremendous education right there. And I don't know of anyone who does such a thing out there i know a while back and I, but i don't look that hard believe me i'm not searching for gurus but a while back I, there were these gurus and, and they're getting sued for 121 million dollars but they were bragging about being the best traders in the world and they showed you these big winners that they caught and it's like well, what about the losing trades in between <laughs> you know anybody could show you some big huge winners what happens in between and that's why i'm doing the next 100 trades and i think we got 90 about 90 trades to go with that, but I don't know if anyone out there who tells you what to do, does it himself or herself, and and then shows you, gives you the archives, warts and all. So I don't know. Maybe I'm getting a little cocky on that one. You know, check check back when uh, when things aren't doing so great. <laughs> okay, as you guys know, we've been talking about this one quite a bit. There was a potentially missed million dollar trade recently. And I want to pick that apart a little bit. It was an IPO, obviously HKD. And looking at the buy at B pattern, I'll try to go through it quickly because we've talked about this pattern quite a bit. If you subscribe to my YouTube channel, and I would ask you to subscribe because it helps support the channel to keep this free content going, you could look up the buy at B pattern and you'll see a lot longer explanations to it. But anyway, buy at B essentially looks to buy at a new closing high in an IPO, ideally on day five. So it comes public on Monday on the close of day five. If it's closing at a new closing high with a couple of caveats, you just buy it. And it, it can be a leap of faith, but man, when this thing works, it's like butter. Anyway, day one, day two. Now, one of those caveats, the day one rule, if day one sets the high for the first four days, okay, if that's the highest the IPO goes, it has to also close above the day one high. So on day two, we took out that high. So the day one high is exceeded. The day one high rule is no longer in effect. Day three, day four, and day five. So what's the highest close out of all these? Highest close is right there, okay? About 27 and three quarters round numbers. Now, when I did my IPO course a few years back, I had the $20 rule, and that was a pretty good rule of thumb. With the buy at B pattern, you want to get in at a little bit lower price, okay? And back then, the research showed that $20 was a good level. Anything above $20, for the most part, let it go. In more recent times, that $20 rule has become the $30 rule, just for those who have the course and um, haven't watch the updates we did on the back end of the website through the Q&A and Facebook and all these other things that we do, I do, I guess, to update these things. Anyway, so the pattern would be to buy this stock market on close, but if it's above $30 a share, and I might give it a little bit of wiggle room, okay? Just like I, you know, that $20 rule slowly crept to 30, maybe give it a little bit of wiggle room on that. Don't Don't make that such a hard and fast rule, but anything above 30, you got to really question the trade. So what happened? Well, it ran from 20 to 68. 
but unfortunately it closed at 68 on that day so that would have been your buy way up that way up there at 68 and that's that's according to the setup closing that high at 68 when 30 is our threshold right it's just way too high to buy it now officially it's not a buy at b but what about an early entry or front run now i've done presentations on this before and it's really cool if you get an opening gap reversal let's say on day five or any day subsequent to day four so it could be on day six or day seven i think this was day six or seven this one happened this wasn't an opening gap reversal but you got a range expansion but on on any day after day four especially late in the day if it looks like it's going to close above the new closing high okay let's say closing high on monday was 28 round numbers or whatever if on friday day five it looks like it's going to close well above 28 or whatever it's pushing pushing toward that or whatever you can it's a little aggressive thing to do but you can get in a little early and i've done this quite a bit in the past and picked up a few points and i've actually it's kind of a rare pattern but man if you if you've got a, a short list of ipos especially that are one week, two weeks, three weeks, and maybe even a month old, and sometimes even much longer, you could actually watch them when they get close to that trigger and kind of front run this setup and do quite well. So what about if we front ran this setup? In this case, okay, well, it's right around 28 or so, and it's beginning to push higher and higher. So let's say you get in 28, 29 or so, and it's beginning to break out of that intraday range okay and there's the math on that and initially in my head and that's why when i started working on the slide and and, and when i wrote about it this morning as i was thinking about it i figured oh you know i'd probably have a thousand shares or something like this had i bought in you know because a thousand shares per 100k at least and I got to thinking about it and it's like, well, hang on, let's see how volatile this thing is. So this will require about an eight point stop. So let's just use that as the math because you wanna at least survive possibly to a recent low or the day's low if you were getting in this pattern. So hypothetically, could you have gotten in? Possibly, okay? So it'd be 100K times 2% is 2000 divided by eight equals 250 shares. Now, by the end of the day you would have had way more than eight eight points profit so let's say you lock and load at eight points and then the stock obviously went up from 28 or whatever the entry was all the way up to 20 something hundred dollars a share and at the peak I did the math on that just on that 125 shares left it would have been a 312 thousand dollar trade okay so let's say your account was a little bigger than 100K or you had a few more accounts or whatever, or trading more accounts. Easily you could have had maybe a few hundred shares of this would have pushed you well over that million dollar mark, okay? Now, did we miss the million dollar trade? Well, I think in perfect hindsight, it would have been in, in perfect honest hindsight, it would have been difficult to do the day five early entry now if that happens like late in the day let's say we're watching this thing and late in the day it's about 28 or whatever that trigger is and you've got about 20 minutes before the close and it's up about five or six points or seven or eight points on the day and it looks like it's going higher and higher and higher you might end up getting in a half an hour before the close or 15 minutes before the close so it didn't set up perfectly but it it it, you could argue that, well, maybe there was a day five entry in this. I don't have any regrets, but I do kind of wake up every now and in the middle of the night and think, dang, you know, that was uh, that could have could have worked. And we were close on that one. One thing that is kind of exciting is it does show the potential of the buy at B pattern. And again, this would have taken a lot of discretion and a leap of faith. And then the other thing too that I didn't show when I was doing some analysis on this, it did have like a 50% drawdown. So it would have been really tough to hang on all the way up to 2,500. Now, one thing it did do, and what could we learn from this, but one thing it did kind of remind me is that you've got to be on your toes. 
And I kept doing my analysis, doing my IPO analysis, and kept doing it, kept doing it, kept doing it, kept doing it throughout this bear market we've been in. And I reached a point where it's kind of like, why am I continuing to do this? Well, like I said earlier, you know, that's kind of like the bad salesman thing. Like, just there's nothing there, there's nothing there, nothing there. But the longer there's no there there, eventually there's going to be something there. So you really have to be on your toes in this game. And I've been slacking a little bit. Now, it might take a few years before we see the next HKD, but if we do our homework every day and don't give up in bear markets like I did, okay, or I got last with, because I didn't even, I didn't even have HKD on my radar. I was in my IPO list, and I'm like, okay, it's, you know, it doesn't look like it's going to trigger. I'm not going to worry about it, but I should have had it on my list and in my watch list on my trading station the day that it triggered. So I have no regrets, but it's there is some shoulda, coulda, woulda there, right? But if we continue to do our homework, and you know, I tell you what's been a godsend for me, John R. If you're here tonight, thank you. I think you are here tonight. Yeah, yeah, I see you. Uh, you know, John R. has really taken this IPO ball and ran with it for the last couple of years. He's been talking a lot about new IPOs in the Facebook group. And it's really been a godsend for me. And there's been a few days, I hate to admit it, because because I'm always preaching about how disciplined I am, how hard I work. <laughs> but, you know, it's a lot to keep up with. It really is. Uh, I slide every now and then in some of this analysis. I'm busy chasing rainbows, trading ETFs, or day trading something when I shouldn't be day trading or whatever, and trying to get out of it near the close. And I forget to do or get too busy to do my IPO analysis. But maybe if... That's the beauty of having this group. We got more than one set of eyes looking at the chart. So maybe with the help from John, other John R. And I noticed some of you other guys are beginning to kind of pick up on the IPO theme. You know, maybe with your help, we'll we'll catch the next HKD. Now, one thing I did want to show you is I took an opening gap reversal trade a couple of days in RBLX, and I I regret not showing you in the Facebook group. But it was a little bit of a tricky one. And when you're trading these opening gap reversals, you've got to be really careful. So opening gap reversal, you got a nice trend and markets making new highs. You have this gap lower, okay? And we're looking for a reversion to the mean move back in the direction of the trend. And you're welcome, John. No, thank you, man. You you do a lot of good work. I've made a lot of money off of you, buddy. I and you know, I I don't want to tell you how much because then you're going to ask me for a check. <laughs> you know, the next time you're writing your check for the service, you're like, well, wait a minute. You know, is he making money off of me? But no, I appreciate you, man. I really do. Thank you. I'm getting a little full clip. But anyway, opening gap reversal, it's like you want to see beer. Yeah, I'll buy you some beer. Yeah, you got it. Uh, now you're going to make me want a beer tonight. Dang it. <laughs> Especially after all this talking. And by AC, you know, it's like turn the AC on and you start talking, it gets hot here quick, especially under these lights that I'm under. Anyway, where was I? Oh, yeah. So you want to see something that's in a nice trend and you want that opening gap reverse to look like a, a setup you would normally trade. So in this case, kind of a TKO ish type of setup, big, thick stock, ideally. Um, name brand stock a lot of times helps out because institutions want to buy it and institutions want to window dress. Okay. Say you're a big institution. In this RBLX, X has doubled in value, and your clients are reading about it, and they're like, oh, man, this is the hottest stock in hot town. And they open up their statements, and they, they look through the portfolio. They want to see this in their portfolio, or they log in and look at it, whatever. So on these opening gap reversals, sometimes the institutions, because the liquidity is so great and the stock's on sale, so to speak. Now, you don't want to rush out and catch a falling knife, but they'll go out to beat the VWAP or whatever they do, and they'll buy the stock and then it'll help to push it higher. Also, these gaps will suck in some shorts, okay, and then spit them out sometimes, not all the time. You know, this is the closest thing to money line in the corner trade, although a lot of times I lose on these opening gap reversals. But if I wait and wait and wait and wait for a good one, this one was, I'd say this one was pretty, pretty good. It wasn't like the, the best setup in setup town, but it was a decent looking setup as you just saw in the daily. Anyway, long story endless, what I wanted to show you here, and again, my apologies for not posting this in the Facebook group, but it was a little tricky because it took off on the open and I almost pulled the trigger, but then the little voice inside of my head said, Dave, 
you got to be really careful buying these things in the open because sometimes you have this euphoria come into the market and sometimes that fizzles out. And luckily, I think I put it in an entry. I'll have, I don't know if the old orders are still in there, but I think I put it in an entry like at 47 or something. It's because if this thing kept going higher, I want it in, even though I'd be buying a little bit higher. And then it begins to implode a little bit. And I was like, okay, aha. When that happens, that kind of fakes out everyone. And what I did was when it started rallying off the lows, I didn't try to catch that that bottom in the stock, but I waited for it to rally a couple of points on the, off the lows, and I waited until it looked like it was really breaking out. Now, in hindsight, maybe I should have entered a little bit higher, but I was thinking about it this morning. This is kind of like a second mouse signal. The early bird gets the worm, but the second mouse gets the cheese, right? And that was a trader years ago that I worked very closely with, taught me a lot about reading charts, and that's where I got that saying from. Kevin Haggerty once told me, uh, we were out uh, drinking Guinness, but he he once told me that, uh, oh, but he, he's no longer with us, but uh, if an Irishman invites you to go drink Guinness with him, don't do it. <laughs> you know, never play cards with a man named Doc. Uh, never eat a place called Mom's. Never sleep with a woman whose troubles are worse than your own. And I'm going to add to that, never drink Guinness with an Irishman, especially especially if you have to work the next day. Anyway, long story, very endless. He told me that when they get a new trader in the office, they only allow them to take second signals. So let's say something sets up triggers. They can't take that first signal early in the morning. They have to wait for the second signal. Now, occasionally that trader is going to miss the mother of all moves, okay? But on many in many cases, that market, that first move is a fake out move, okay? Everybody's watching it. Everybody gets all excited, sucks them in, spits them out. And, and again, always think about the psychology of the market. What is this stock doing? Okay, it rallied up. You know it sucked in some people, sold off hard. You know it spit them out, okay? So the second move, the second mouse trade, that might be a way to go. And that's what I was thinking on this one. And again, my apologies for not throwing it out. I Sometimes with these opening gap reversals, I'm looking for perfection before I throw them out into the Facebook group. So. This one was was pretty damn good, but it wasn't absolutely perfect. The gap could have been a little bit bigger, maybe. Um, the way it kind of faked out, it was kind of crazy. But anyway, so that's where I got in. And again, my apologies for not showing it. There's the trades that just 200 shares. That's all I needed in this particular account. And you can see if you add that up, it comes to 498. So round numbers 500 bucks. I did take it to multiple accounts. And I did, I don't know if I should admit this or not, but I did hang on to 100 shares for SGs, and I did flip those out today. I, I was a little, I, you know, my goal with those shares initially was I'm just going to sit on them forever, put my stop at break even, kind of like the, the trend volume more on stuff we do, like I talked about earlier, and maybe sit in this thing and maybe it'll become a double or a triple or whatever. And it was up five points earlier in the day. And I didn't even think about it. And then it's like, you know what? Let me put in a trailing stop. And I got stopped out today. Picked up a couple extra points today. Didn't get that five points earlier. So, you know, maybe shame on me for keeping a day trade overnight. But sometimes if something sets up like a swing trade and looks like it has longer term potential, it's okay to keep a few shares on. I know you can't get a little bit pregnant, but I did it, it all, uh, full disclosure, do that in, in an account, in my IRA account where I'm trying to not do as much of the day trading, trying to hold on as long as possible to things. And I figured that, you know, what harm could it do with 100 shares? I know it could have gapped down 10 points, 100 shares, 10 points, 100 shares. What's that, 1,000 bucks? And, you know, you make a 500 today, but then you lose 1,000 tomorrow. So, you know, that's open, that's open for debates, whether or not you should keep a piece. But in this particular account, I like to try to do things as a trader would from the perspective of the pattern. Pattern's an opening gap reversal. I need to be out on close. So you can see I exited this one right around the close. You can see there's about uh, two or three quarters minutes left, two, 241, two minutes and 41 seconds left when the exit. I think it was kind of coming off the highs and it's like, okay, how greedy do you want to be? And I had other trades on that had to be exited. So anyway, there's the trades for the open gap reversal. If you can't sleep at night and you really want to learn more about opening gap reversals, when we first started doing the Q&A, which we no longer do since we have the Facebook group, okay? 
But when we first did the Q&A in the members area, you would think it was the opening gap reversal course, right? Because that's mostly what we talked about. Just because there's a lot of things to know when it comes to trading on opening gap reversal, a little bit more advanced. I don't have a service or anything where I point out opening gap reversals, although I will throw them out. I didn't throw this one out. Again, my apologies. But when, when I really like one, I'll throw it out. Now, hopefully I didn't jinx myself because you guys can see the next one I throw out and think, well, if they're throwing this out, it must be the mother of all opening gap reversals. Anyway, let's uh, any, any questions or thoughts about anything so far? Uh, if not, let's shift gears, take a, a quick look at crypto. And the bottom line is, as I've been saying quite a bit, I know it was a couple of weeks since I did one of these presentations, but crypto has been heating up as of late. And I was talking about that a few weeks ago, and I officially called a bottom in Bitcoin, and I did with a caveat, right? <laughs> the caveat is, eh, I'm right, but I might be a little early. And like they said in the big short, that's the same thing, Michael. So maybe i'm right but early but i do like the way it's beginning to how do i how do i do this anybody know how to fix this okay i do like the way it kind of bottomed out and then began to kind of pull away from the the 30 ema and i think that i think that it's beginning to get a little bit of of traction in here and i do think or i'm assuming that the the people, you know, with Bitcoin, I think there's probably, there's, there's a newer type of trader that's coming into the market. Now, as Bitcoin matures and everybody's familiar with it, then eventually I think that uh, it'll trade, it'll mature, as some people say, it'll become more mature and trade in a different fashion. But right now, I think you got some buy and hope people that are coming in. I think you got a lot of people who missed the boat and saw, watched in anguish as it ran up to 60K or whatever it was. So I do think you still have a lot of those people waiting in their wings. Uh, I think there's a lot of hodl people in Bitcoin. To my surprise, I, I don't have a lot, but I have a little bit hodled just for S and Gs. Okay, don't come, don't come five dollar wrench me, right? Because you're not going to get much money, believe me. It's not much, but I have a tiny bit hodled, and I do have a little bit in GBTC and an IRA, but not a lot, you know, not enough to where if it goes to zero, it, it, I'd be mad, but it, it wouldn't kill me, right? But I do think there's, there's a lot more hodling going on, and maybe it's bad behavior from me, but I do think it, it doesn't hurt to own a little bit of Bitcoin. I'm talking about a, a little bit. If it takes off, you've got a little bit, and a little bit becomes a lot of bit. If it goes to zero, then you're not going to lose your ass. I know I sound like Michael Saylor a little bit <laughs> every time you listen to it. It's like I listened to him the other day thinking like, oh, boy, he's really going to, you know, how he's going to talk his way out of this one. And it's because something about he's he's uh, moving away from micro strategy to focus on whatever. And, and I'm thinking like, how is he going to get out of this? And then. By the end of the presentation, I'm 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 almost thinking about buying some more Bitcoin to hodl. You know, it's just he's such a bull and he makes so much sense. Anyway, so Bitcoin, I still think it's bottoming out. I think you have time though; you don't have to rush out just yet. It's got a couple of 230 EMA breakouts. Bar one, bar two. This one didn't trigger. Bar one, bar two. This one sort of triggered. Depends on how much wiggle room you gave. It came right back in, but didn't fail that bad. Okay, or that fail that badly. So you might have been able to stick it out, bar one, bar two. This would trigger if the 30s are stopped, and yeah, you got stopped out. But if you're just kind of hanging on, all these buys in here, it really didn't get clocked too bad. So I still think it's bottoming out. I wouldn't get too excited just yet, though. And I've done many presentations before, and I've seen other people talk about this, too. I'm going like, have you? You know, that chart looks awfully familiar. Did you just scrape that chart? out of my presentation, or did you go make your own chart? Um, but, you know, that's a, that's another story altogether. But I've seen some other people talk about the fact that there's a there's a, um, a high correlation between the stock market and Bitcoin, okay? What percent of the total portfolio for Bitcoin? Uh, I would say kind of nickel and dime it a little bit. I, you know, here's the thing. I think deep down, everyone should own one. And years ago, I wrote an article. And uh, by the time I got to finish in the article, 
Bitcoin had ran from like 4,000 to 20,000 and changed. So at 4,000, I was kind of of the belief that everyone should own one, okay? And, you know, not to confuse the issue with facts, but at 21 million, as I wrote in the article, which is on my website, that's just enough. If everybody in Florida wanted one Bitcoin, it's just enough for everybody to have one or every other person in California to have one, okay? So I think everybody should own at least one and maybe do that through derivatives and some hodling and, you know, you gotta be careful, not your keys, not your coins and Google that and you'll understand. Uh, I wouldn't go nuts on it and percentage wise, just a few percent, you know, if you have big, big portfolios and let's say you had a million dollar portfolio, then yeah, maybe one, one Bitcoin, you know, what's that? Uh, that wouldn't be much at all. Um, like that would be, let's see, one, let's say 24,000 divided by one, one, two, three, four, five, six equals yeah that's that's uh two hundreds two and a half hundredths of a percent or something like that if my math is correct on that you know something small so small to where you can kind of sweep it under the rug and expect to lose if, if you're going to hodl an asset okay expect expect to lose at least half of your money and believe me when when this thing is below the 30 EMA, I'm not trying to bottom fish and add, but when I see it start to rally on occasion, I will add a tiny bit. And by a tiny bit, I mean like just a little bit, you know, a few thousand here and there. And I don't want to own, I'm not trying to bet the forum and own a ton of it. I just want to own an adequate amount, okay? So what percentage of portfolio? Less than half of a percent, okay? Um, you know, Michael Saylor makes great arguments, right? So he said, I think he said 1%. So if you put 1% of your portfolio in it and it goes to zero, you lose 1% of your portfolio. If you put 1% of your portfolio and it goes up 100 times, then you've doubled your entire portfolio. So I, I think that's a pretty good argument. Again, he makes so many good arguments. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like, he, he almost mucks up my buying my uh, trader mentality mantra. Here's one I took the other day. I haven't thrown out these trades in a while just because there haven't been that many of them. But as the crypto continues to heat up, I might throw them out. I like the way it kind of bottomed out in here. And then in this case, I took a 230 EMA, which is just two bars of daylight again, buy above the high. So I bought somewhere in here, flipped it out around 20% higher for half of it. And now I'm holding on to the duress, to the rest of it. Hopefully not to the duress. <laughs> Hopefully it wasn't a Freudian slip. So just real quick, and I'm not going to go through too many of them just due to time constraints tonight. But if you sort by percentage, and let's see, people ask me about stocks when I'm man on the street. So anything, any stocks you see in here is kind of like man on the street type of stocks. But you could see that there are some in here beginning to heat up. Now, some of these are super, super thin. But as you go through these, and this is something that I need to really start doing. It's like I backed off on all my Bitcoin or my crypto analysis, uh, shitcoin analysis, actually, S-H-Y-T, because there hasn't been a whole lot of action as of late. But you can see now these things are beginning to heat up once again. So I would start doing your homework again in crypto. I know some of you never stopped, and congratulations on that. I was a crazy crypto guy about, you know, this interview I just had today is not going to be published for like six months. And they wanted to know how I felt about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. So it's kind of like, eh. you know, so six months from now, I might look like an idiot. So I tried to couch by saying longer term, I think there's potential there. Shorter term, lots of ups and downs, which is, you know, how do you make a prediction six months that's going to be published six months from now? I don't know. That's going to be tough. But I digress. All right, let's take a look at the market, the stock market that is, real quick. And then um, if you guys want to ask about individual stocks, I know we talk about stocks on and off all day. 
So I doubt there'll be too many questions tonight. But anybody new here, if you want to ask about individual stocks, now would be a good time to do so. NASDAQ Composite, since we hear opening gap reversal, nice little Landry light so far above that 30 EMA. So far, so good there. Let's take a look at the P's. S&P 500, nice little Landry light all the way back to July 18th. We have not touched that 30 EMA, okay? So we've got a new trend developing. Now, one thing I was also asked about today, last week at Van Camp, is how do I balance the short term versus longer term? And I had various answers for that. But right now, so far, we're still sort of in this bear market phase on a weekly chart. But in order for the market to turn back up and become a bull market, the daily is going to have to turn first. And I know some of you guys, uh, John, uh, Jim, I'm sorry, Jim F. in the group, you'll actually look at an hourly chart and look for like a bow tie and hourly chart, especially like down here at all, at all time, not all time lows, but multi month lows. That's a great little thing to look for. You're going to be wrong a lot, but when you finally catch it, you're going to be one of the earliest people in the market. So write that down as part of your analysis is take a look at that hourly hourly bow tie, something I need to do more of. It's like, you know, if I made a list of everything I should be doing just because I'm spread a little thin as one person, it would be a pretty long list, but it doesn't take that long to say, okay, once a week at least, I want to check the hourly chart to see where we are, especially once you see a rally on the daily. No need to check it while the market's imploding like this, but when the daily begins to turn, check out, you know, turn early and has it completely turned around, Start looking at that hourly chart. Bonds, interesting that bonds were trying to bottom out, but then they got whacked today. So I think this is going to be more of a process, maybe a head and shoulders bottom here for now. I found it interesting with everything going on in the world that bonds were rallying for quite some time. I know there's some yield curve problems that uh, people are talking about. I don't concern myself with that too much because that usually works itself out, usually being a keyword in that sentence. The dollar is finally beginning to lose some steam in here. As you can see, two days of Landry light below the 30 EMA. So that's a bit of a concern. And as the dollar drops, that might help out Bitcoin. Semiconductors, try to rally day came back in. In general, as you can see, they've been kind of bottoming out. Now keep in mind these areas like the semis and like the overall market, they're making a bottom at high levels. I prefer to see a bottom like way down here at multi-year lows, okay? But I'm not going to be obstinate in wait for that perfection. As you just saw, I'm seeing these crypto-related stocks doing really well, so I'm going after them. Some biotech stocks doing really well, so I'm going after them. And some miscellaneous stocks, drug stocks, et cetera, that are doing okay, so I'm going after them, okay? If we can at least get a short-term pop and that stop to break even, then we're, we're winning, okay? If one of them turns, or two or three or four or five, turn into a longer-term winner, then we're really winning. Anyway, as you go through most of these sectors, most are looking pretty good. Transports have been coming back with a vengeance today, notwithstanding. Kind of wide and loose and all over the place, but not that far away. A few percent, I think 8%, if memory serves, 8% away or so from, yeah, 8.5% away from all-time highs or thereabouts. So kind of interesting there. All right, any individual stocks? Going once, going twice, Q, B, T S Q B T S. Okay. Okay. It comes from John, our IPO guru. Day one, day two, day three, day four. All right. Where's your buy? What did we just talk about? Well, it's got to be about the day one high, right? Nope. Because this day here took it out. So there's no longer a day one buy rule. So where would the buy be? The buy would be right there the buy at b is at 1242 so you can make that 1250 round numbers so tomorrow and i love the friday ones although it is a little nervous it does make you make you a little nervous big leap of faith to buy these on friday and then say geez what did i just do and wait all weekend to find out <laughs> but yeah uh i will buy this tomorrow i'll play along with you the only thing that's a little concerning is I'd really have to do a little bit more analysis. It's got pretty good volume in here, but today's volume was a little on the light side. So I'd have to check the spread and see how it's trading. But if we see a lot of volume tomorrow, not that I care about volume in and of itself with predictive value. I care about volume to make sure it's liquid enough to trade. And I'm not buying something that's, that's illiquid and has a huge spread. And I'm immediately down, let's say, by 1,000 shares of this. 
I'm immediately down like a thousand dollars because of one point spread. And if I do that a couple of three times, then I'm, you know, going to the weekend down five, six K or whatever, and it's going to be a long weekend. So I want to see lots and lots of volume to where at least I'm not getting creamed on the spread. But yeah, absolutely. This one looks really, really, really good. So good eye on that one. Kudos to you, John. I will buy you some beer if it pays off. If it doesn't, it's like, well, I'm a big boy, okay? All right, Robert, you know why? You know, when I see a gap in anything other than a commodity stock, I immediately throw it out. I just don't like gaps against the trend. I don't like, especially don't like gaps in the setup. I know it filled the gap, but no, I would leave that alone. There's other, what's the one am I, what am I, which, what am I thinking of? There's one recently that was in the Landry list. You can go and look at the archives. It was it was an I was a, a REIT that really took off. I regret not taking it. Oh, I don't know if this is a REIT or not, is it? Uh, yeah, this is a REIT. Okay. So I would leave that alone. Yeah, I just kind of almost across the board, throw them out. There's a gap, unless it's a commodity related stock, SWAV. I sold Suave before earnings. Where would you look to re-enter? Well, if you're if you're trying to catch longer term trends, you're gonna have to hold through earnings, okay? So ARLP, for example, you know, every three months, let's see, one, two, three earnings, one, two, three earnings, one, two, three earnings, one, two, three earnings, one, two, three earnings. You get the idea, right? And so far, obviously, that's been a pretty good run. 400 percent you know, run or whatever. So pretty happy with that type of run. So you're going to have to hold through some earnings. And where you get whacked, yes. Occasionally you will get whacked. But like in your case, if you were, now I don't know where you got hit. I don't see any pattern of mine here. So I assume you're doing something other than what I do. But let's say you're doing my stuff and this you're supposed to be still long this stock. You can't bail out just because some earnings are on the horizon, okay? Yes, you will get whacked on occasion, but longer term, if you get out before earnings, you're never going to capture a longer term trend. So I don't see any place to get in, Sam. It would actually have to set up as like a TKO or something. So maybe if it sets up as a TKO, at this point in time, there's lower level stocks like the Riot we just saw, but there's plenty of other ones just like Riot that are making these major, major, major bottoms. I'd be more excited to go after that than something that's making uh, near all time highs. So in the future, if your plan is to hang on to stocks, and, and let's say to, in that case you take you took partial profits and you have a stop in mind, then just hang on to them. And as I've said a thousand times, that's what makes it easier for me. It's like, damn, I'm losing money on this stock, or I'm giving up a, a, a shit ton of open profits. What should I do? And it's like, well, if it's a trading service stock, it's a it's a no-brainer. I'll pull the spreadsheet. It's like, well, service says I need to stick with it. Because when I report the trade to you guys, not that I report every trade, but lately I've been doing that, as I said earlier. But when I report that trade, I need to show how I, I pretty much followed the system within, within a few little parameters and maybe a little bit of discretion. Internet at 202, exit at 220. And yes, I've been whacked a few times, especially the year, this year. So I'm gun shy on risky stocks on earnings. Yeah, you know, and, and that's what the market will teach you, okay? The market taught me over the last several months to stop spending a half an hour or 15 minutes or however long. It really didn't take that long. I'd probably do it in 10 minutes. But the market taught me like, hey, Dave, there's no IPOs to trade. Why are you wasting your time? You know, and sometimes that could be like at a deep, lower level. Psycho I don't want to go on freshman psychology on you, but sometimes our brains can trick us, okay? And uh, that's, I wish I could remember the quote uh it's it's from one of these uh psychologists that writes a lot of these books but he basically said that your mind is constantly trying to trick you well boy does that dovetail into markets okay so it's like you get whacked you get whacked you get whacked by holding through earnings and you're like man that hurts i'll never do that again so you finally quit doing that you're feeling pretty good hey i gotta start for earnings i'm not gonna get whacked what happens? It takes off without you. That's markets, okay? That's like me. I got a little lax with the IPOs, and you know, I missed I missed at least a million dollar trade, at least for me personally. I think it would have been that. But it, you know, it's all hypotheticals. And what would the world be without hypothetical questions? Said Mr. Wright with a W. All right. Any more? Going once, going twice. Obviously, I want to thank everybody for attending tonight. Anything unanswered? Bring it up at Facebook. We'll we'll noodle with it. 
If you're not in Facebook and you want to join Dave Landry's Trend Traders and Facebook, if you don't do Facebook, join as your dog or some other alias. Let me know it's you. The only caveat, and, and tomorrow I'm going to have 15 or 20 new people want to join. The only caveat is everybody has to have skin in the game. And my skin in the game, obviously, is taking time out of my schedule to post trades there, to talk about the system, to answer questions. So everybody gets a benefit from that instead of this one-on-one -on -one email back and forth that I've done for the last 20 something years, ruining my wrists <laughs> and elbows in the process. But that's another story altogether. You have to be at least a gold member of daylearner.com, which is, which is, I think it's cheap or, at, or a service member, which you'll get gold for free. So I'll put some links before, when this thing posts on uh, YouTube tomorrow for that, if you're interested. And we have a really good group of Say So Myself. Like I said, a lot of you guys are out there picking up things, some things I missed. I haven't, I didn't see that IPO today for some reason. So I need to figure out what I did wrong, why it's not in my database and why I didn't pick it up. So we help each other, you know, as again, as my wife said, Marcy said, that's the best thing I've ever done was starting that group. And, and we all kind of, need that psychological support and it all helps us to to look at stocks and say hey do you see this i saw this or i saw that and and noodle with it a little bit and figure out whether or not we should take these trades anyway i know i'm biased but i love the group i love you guys and girls appreciate that so thanks for thanks for being being a client and uh if you get anything if you got anything on this video please like it if you don't like it go have no fun somewhere else <laughs> i'm half kidding uh, please subscribe, help support the channel. The more you support the channel, subscribe, like it, the better the algorithm picks it up and the more time I can, in, in effort, obviously I can put into uh, these setups and, and it'll be, um, it'll encourage me to do more and more uh, shows like this. Anyway, I think that's it. Everybody have a great weekend if we'll talk between now and then and may the trend be with you. Thank you so much.